everyone and welcome to this new lecture of the Center for Ignatian Spirituality in collaboration with the Ritchie Institute for Chinese Western Cultural History that we have entitled Matteo Ricci's Mission to the Middle Kingdom, Sociable Scholar and Solitary Saint. So my name is Tomeo Storrich. I'm the director of the Center for Ignatian Spirituality. It has been one of the center's goal during these past years to offer to our Boston College community an annual lecture featuring a prominent Jesuit figure uh, in history. We started a few years ago portraying Father Pedro Arrupe, the 28th uh, Superior General of the Society of Jesus. Last year, we focused on Cardinal Carlo Maria Martini, another giant, not only in the Society of Jesus, but in the Catholic Church during the 20th and the 21st century. And this year, we are looking back to much earlier times. We want to focus on, the most, uh, on one of the most prominent Jesuits during the initial years of the Society of Jesus, uh, Matteo Ricci. We will heard a lot about him, um, but just let me say just a few words, very few. Matteo Ricci was born in 1552 in Italy, in Maserata, and died in 1610 in Beijing, China. And he was an Italian Jesuit missionary who introduced Christianity, uh, Christian teaching to the Chinese empire in the 16th century. He lived there for nearly 30 years and was a pioneer in the attempt at mutual comprehension between China and the West. To talk about him and his legacy, we have invited Father Anthony Useller, the director of the Ricci Institute. Let me say just a few words about him. Uh, Professor Useller is a Jesuit priest and a historian of pre-modern Japan. He's also co-editor of the Brill monograph series, a Studies in the History of Christianity in East Asia. His research focuses primarily on the intellectual history of Christianity in Japan and the connected histories that mark the arrival of Europeans in Eastern Asian countries. He has authored and edited multiple works, including Christianity and Cultures, Japan and China in Comparison, 1543-1644, and his most recent publication, The Samurai and the Cross, The Jesuit Enterprise in Pre-Modern Japan. His lecture will last for about 40 minutes, and then we'll have a few minutes for questions and answers. So join me with a round of applause to welcome Father Anthony Yusola. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Here, and the microphone is working. So, as I say, if you don't like the lecture, the good, the good news is at least you have good proof of these material. So, I think it will survive. Well, welcome on this feast of all saints, which we chose for this presentation. And my thanks, of course, to Tomeo at the Center for Asian Spirituality for this opportunity to uh, deliver this uh, lecture today. So on December 17th last year, on Pope Francis's own birthday, he declared Romeo Michi to be a man whose life exhibited heroic virtues, thereby bestowing upon him the title of Venerable. And this is an important uh, process in the Catholic Church, a key step on the way to beatification and canonization. That is the acknowledgement by the church that a person is a saint whose example is valid for the life of the entire universal church. So Pope Francis specifically referred to him as the ideal missionary, a man capable of enculturation, dialogue, and openness to others. So what does this exactly mean? Who was Matteo Ricci? And why is he so important? So before I attempt to answer that, let me begin with something more contemporary that is connected directly to Ricci's legacy over 400 years ago. During his recent and historic apostolic visit to Mongolia, at the end of the Mass in the capital, Ulaanbaatar, <clears throat> Pope Francis asked retired Cardinal Tong on the left and Cardinal Zhao, his successor, both from Hong Kong, to come to the altar to pray together with him 
to the noble people of China. In fact, there were quite a number of Chinese who came all the way to Mongolia <coughs> for the occasion and were present at the papal mass. In his address, Pope Francis also spoke directly to the Chinese Christians present and exhorted them to be both good Christians and good citizens of their country. Now back to Stephen Job for a moment, who was standing with the Pope and Cardinal Kong in the previous photo. He was the former provincial superior of the Jesuits in China and was appointed Bishop of Hong Kong on May 17, 2021. It was Stephen Zhao who agreed to the move of the Ricci Institute from San Francisco to Boston. And it is he who signed the agreement with Father Leahy here at Boston College. A month ago, on September 30th, Pope Francis made him a cardinal, thereby making him the first uh, Jesuit cardinal on the Chinese mainland. He has a curious bishop's crest, including a giraffe that sticks out of it. The giraffe's long neck, he said, symbolizes being able to see the big picture. He notes short-sightedness can cause fear in oneself. Looking with vision can help one calm down. Zhao also noted that giraffes are known for having big hearts to pump enough blood to their heads and can therefore be considered a symbol of generosity. This is something that he had shared with his former students. I received, he says, some pictures of giraffes from students which were posted in my office at Wyang College. This is a reference to the two well-known Jesuit schools in Hong Kong. Other symbols that are um, included here is, of course, the biblical symbol of the Holy Spirit as a dove, the name contained in the IHS monogram, Christ, and also, we have a multicolored Celtic knot, which the diocese said was a symbol of unity and plurality. By the way, Stephen Zhao had also studied in Ireland. Beneath the rainbow, uh, sorry, beneath the rainbow-colored knot is a suspension bridge, which is specifically Hong Kong's Qingma Bridge. But let's go back to Mongolia. This is quite an extraordinary photograph. Relations of the Catholic Church with Mongolia go back to the times of Kublai and Genghis Khan in the 13th century when they were the rulers of China. Christians constituted a significant minority in their kingdom and were tolerated by their rulers. We learn about this from Marco Polo's travels in Asia, undertaken with his father, Niccolò Polo, and his uncle, uh, Matteo Polo, Venetian merchants travelers between 1271 and 1295. He recounts his experience at the court of Kublai Khan, the greatest Eastern ruler of the time, whom Marco would serve for almost 17 years. In 1286, Arhun, the Mongolian Il Khan of Persia, sent a request to the Pope through a monk of the Assyrian Church of the East, asking for Catholic missionaries to be sent the court of the great Khan. Pope Nicholas IV received the letter in 1287, and as a result, the first Franciscan missionary, Giovanni di Montecorvino, was sent to Beijing, then known in Mongolian as Khan Balik. He established a church there in 1299, and again in 1305, and is considered the founder of the Catholic Church in China. And Marco Polo was still present. Uh, at this time. Here we see a beautiful manuscript for our library, this is important, from the Bodleian Library in Oxford, showing Marco Polo and Matteo Polo presenting the letters of the Pope to Kublai Khan. Now speaking of Marco Polo, the Ricci Institute has this unique rubbing made from a tombstone discovered in 1951 in Yangzhou, it belongs to Caterina Biglioni, one of the first known Europeans to have resided in China and who died there in 1342. Her family were Genoese merchants and were linked to the trade started by Marco Polo. 
I mentioned earlier the Assyrian Church of the East, a commemorative stele or stone monument dating back to 781, was discovered around 1623. The engraved reading, the engraved heading reads, Memorial Study of the Propagation in China of the Luminous Religion, that is Church of the East, of the Roman Empire, Da Qi. It indicates that Eastern Christianity had reached the Chinese capital of Xi'an as early as 635 in the 7th century in the Tang Dynasty. Early European geographical knowledge of China is depicted on this late medieval early Renaissance world map, a planisphere dating from around 1450 and attributed to the well-known Venetian monk Travaro. It depicts the so-called Ecumene, the entire world with all known lands of the time. This treasure is preserved in the Biblioteca Marciana in Venice. Herein, we find the first references to Tartaria, or Tartary, the lands occupied by the Mongols, who we're talking about. It's also there that we get the word cafe, or kapayo, an early European designation for northern China ruled by the Mongols, hence the name for the airline of Hong Kong, Cafe Pacific, which I'm going to take uh, next month to get there. So I will think about the map of Tramalro as I do this. <coughs> now, after the Middle Ages, among the first missionaries to venture to Asia, beginning with India, the Malay Peninsula, and Indonesia, before making his way to Japan was Francis Xavier. He had hoped to find his passage to China, but he fell ill and died on the southern Chinese island of Shangchuan within sight of the mainland without fulfilling his dream. But the year he died was the year Matteo Ricci was born. He would fulfill that dream. So who was Ricci, Xavier's successor who inspired him, continues to inspire so many? We know that he came to be regarded and respected as an upright man of great virtue and a gentleman scholar who had traveled thousands of leagues from the great west Chinese referred to his homeland. But what he continues to be remembered for to this day was that he befriended the Chinese people in a spirit of openness and respect and was willing not only to learn from them, but also to be transformed at a deep personal level by this encounter. And therein, perhaps, we shall uncover his greatest legacy. <coughs> so let's first consider the historical and cultural context in which Ricci arrived in China, which is why I'm going to call upon Ricci himself to speak to us and perhaps explain in his own words and through his own copious correspondence and that of others who work with him. What inspired him to adopt a somewhat peculiar method of preaching the Christian faith in the Middle Kingdom that we today refer to as cultural accommodation or enculturation? A method that in great part, thanks to him and his successors, we now take for granted, but which was far from being the obvious choice in his own day. The story of Ricci's journey to China begins a generation after a savior with another great Italian missionary, Alessandro Valignano, who died in Macau, China in 1606, just as he was preparing on his journey to the Chinese mainland to visit Matteo Ricci. He supported Ricci's work for over two decades, and Ricci would later refer to him as the father of the Chinese mission. Valignano had known Ricci since their first meeting in Rome in 1571 at the Roman College, when he had briefly also acted as his substitute novice master. He was then later sent by Everard Mercurian to be the delegate, the general's delegate, for all the missions of the so-called East Indies. Let's listen to an early report that Valignano wrote from Japan about his experience of the Middle Kingdom. The Kingdom of China is very different from any other kingdom or eastern province, and upon setting foot in it, one gets the impression of entering a totally new world. 
It is very similar to Europe, and yet it is more advanced in many ways. Quite a statement to make for an Italian nobleman. First of all, China is very vast and has only one king, who is the richest and most powerful king anywhere in the world. And the whole kingdom, with all its towns, cities, and even villages, all belong to the king of China, who has officials in every part of the country who are known as mandarins. Some of these are in charge of affairs relating to war and have been nobles and mandarins for generations, and they advance in dignity according to their achievements. Yet others are responsible for the government of the land, as well as the administration of justice and the welfare of the people. These mandarins achieve their positions of dignity only by merit of their virtuous conduct and learning, which is held in even greater esteem in China than in Europe. And as official positions of honor and government are only granted to the literati, all strive to excel in letters, which is why China is the best governed kingdom of any in existence. Yeah, this is quite an amazing statement to make, and quite a discovery uh, for Bolognano at this time. As a result, he decides to send two Italian Jesuits, Michele Ruggeri and Matteo Ricci, to Macau to learn Chinese, something the Portuguese already present there thought of as a totally hopeless enterprise. I couldn't understand why Bolognano would do such a thing. Let's listen now to what Valignano has to say about the arrangements in his mail. There are already two fathers, Ruggeri and Ricci, here in Macau, studying the language, and they are making great progress. We can confidently hope that their efforts will not be in vain. For this purpose, I have provided them with teachers, and with a separate house, and with all the necessary means of leisure to dedicate themselves wholly to this task. In the Roman archives of the Society of Jesus, we have here the first Portuguese Chinese dictionary in Chinese primer composed by Ricci and Ricci, uh, by Ricci and Ruggeri together. We are also fortunate to have this language practice sheet entirely in Ricci's own hand, including transcriptions of the pronunciation of each Chinese character the first time that this was ever done. Soon, Ruggeri, his companion, who had arrived earlier, was attempting to compose a catechism for the Chinese. And here you see from the Biblioteca Nazionale in Rome the first attempt at that, which was, first of all, in Latin. Pedro Gomez, the distinguished theologian, who would later go to Japan and help to establish the first Jesuit schools there, reports to Rome from Macau as follows. During these months I have spent here in Macau, Father Ruggeri and I have been busy preparing a brief history of the world, together with a book of Christian doctrine in dialogue format that will be translated into Chinese. Ruggeri's Catechism, a landmark achievement, was printed in classical Chinese in 1584. It included an appendix with the first translations of the Ten Commandments and the prayers of the Hail Mary and of the Our Father. At first, Bolognano was very enthusiastic about this edition and hoped it could be used in Japan as well on account of being composed in classical Chinese, the lingua franca of East Asia, not unlike Latin and Greek in the West. This is what he has to say. The catechism that was composed in the Chinese language will also be of great help to the learned bonzes, and that is why I have written to China, instructing them to send numerous copies to Japan. Again, this is interesting because we also see the intercultural transmission of knowledge through the printing press, and of course, printing was already highly developed in China at this time. But 10 years later, he would say just the opposite of what you heard. So 
what happened during those years to make him change his mind so radically? Well, one reason for Valignano's change in opinion of Ruggieri's catechism had a lot to do with Ruggieri's insistence on adapting to Buddhism and adopting Buddhist dress. And he found that the Buddhists were not the proper interlocutor for him in China at this time. So he instructed Ricci to recompose the catechism and eliminate Buddhist references whilst adopting Confucian ones. Father Ruggieri knows very little of the Chinese language and its literature. Father Matteo Ricci, who has now mastered Chinese very well, is preparing another catechism that will be a much more suitable and well-arranged translation than that of Father Ruggieri. And so we see here a first disagreement, even among the missionaries themselves, Ruggieri versus Valignano and Ricci, on which type of cultural adaptation should take place. The result was Ricci's true meaning of the Lord of Heaven, or the Tian Zhu Shi Yi, which was composed in the 1590s and then printed in 1603. Valignano could not forget how Francis Xavier had first adopted Buddhist language in Japan, translating the word God, or Deus, with Dainichi Nyura, the Japanese word for the cosmic Buddha, taken from esoteric Buddhism. A cultural, linguistic, and religious misunderstanding that Valignano had no intention of repeating in China. So Valignano thought that Ricci's works could also serve the purpose of preaching food books to the learned Buddhist monks of Japan, as we've already heard. Now Ricci has the following to say about this point. It gave us great consolation to know that many of our works written in Chinese characters were useful in Japan on account of their use of the same characters. For this reason, Father Valignano reprinted my catechism in Canton in order to have it sent to Japan. And Father Francesco Basio has requested that I send him many of these books, for they have great authority in Japan, insofar as they come from China. And tomorrow, we're going to have another event uh, related to the first priest in Korea, on Andrew Kim Begon. And it was also the Koreans who read Matteo Ricci's books written in Chinese. So it was not only the Japanese, but also the Koreans would be influenced by this, as later on would the Vietnamese church. So here you begin to see all of these different connected histories. Now Ricci then goes on to explain his entire scholarly strategy of engaging with the Chinese mandarins and why he considered it of paramount importance to do so. And it is for this reason that I do everything so that our fathers study very well the books of China and learn how to compose in Chinese. For to tell the truth, which may be hard to believe, one accomplishes more in China with books than with words. Più si fa nella Cina con libri che con parole. Do more with books than with words. Well, he sounds like a member of the Tenure and Promotion Committee. <laughs> <laughs> so, he further reiterates this point in a letter that he composed the year before his death. It reveals how which he found his missionary activity centered principally around scholarly endeavors and dialogue. There is great hope in the abundant fruit that is to be gained from such a vast kingdom for in this kingdom, learning, and consequently all sciences and opinions founded on reason, are held in high esteem. And thus there is no nobility here that is given any consideration except for learning, and no one is noble but those who are learned and hold degrees. And that is why it would be simple to persuade the rulers of this kingdom with our holy faith through evidence provided by reason. And if they concede, it will be easy to convert everyone else. Perhaps a little bit over, over enthusiastic <laughs> and over optimistic, but this was the main thrust of his thinking. He further reiterates this point in a letter that he composed 
um, both before this and after this, but let's hear some more. What follows is the ease with which we can spread our holy Christian religion with books, which can enter everywhere without any obstacles. And so it is that as these books spread, they speak to more people and with greater consideration and precision than we can by word of mouth. And of this we have undeniable experience. In fact, our holy law, or at least a good opinion of it, has spread further by means of the four or five books that we have printed than by mere words or any other means hitherto employed by us. But what about Ricci's own library? We know that among his own books, Ricci had a reprint of this famous atlas, first published in 1570 by Abraham Ortelius, the famous cartographer. And I would be very disappointed if our good Christian Dupont does not have a copy of this edition at the Burns Library. I'm sure there is one. Ricci's copy was a reprint dated from the 1590s, which he would end up radically adopting to his new scholarly audience in Beijing. <clears throat> the projection of the world by Ortelius and Locator, which we are familiar with in the West, places Europe and the Atlantic at the center, thereby dividing the world into hemispheres and placing China and the rest of Asia at the very far end of the map. And this is where we get the expression far east because it comes from this projection of Ortelius' map. Well, this was not acceptable to the learned inhabitants of the Middle Kingdom, which is the meaning of the word China. Thus, Richard's creative scientific work included composing a new world map, which the Chinese had never seen before, and which included a wealth of scientific information, both astronomical and even geological, besides the geographical data. It was entitled Huyu Wangguo Chiantu, a complete map of the myriad kingdoms of the globe, and was first printed in 1602. Now this is a hand-colored copy made in Japan in 1604, and if you go to the BC uh, website of the history department, to which I belong, this is the background that you'll see when you open the History Department website. <laughs> Note how to place the Pacific at the center of the map and China very, very close to the center. And now suddenly, it's Boston that has become the far east <laughs> on this map, as you can see. Ricci also put to good use the scientific knowledge he had acquired at the Roman College when he was a student of the famous astronomer and mathematician, Christopher Clavius, who had engaged with and was well respected by Galileo Galilei. One of the books he had studied was Euclid's Elements, which Clavius edited and published in Rome in 1574. I'm sure you have a copy of this at Burns as well. And he also produced, in 1607, the first translation of Euclid into Chinese. The word he used to translate geography, <coughs> or the word jihe, or jihe xie, is still used today, not only in Chinese, but also in Japanese and in Korean. So, hikagaku, or hihaha. So we have we have this influence that is truly remarkable. Now, besides translating the terminology used by Euclid, it also reproduced and adapted a number of diagrams from the original edition with Chinese annotations. In the preface, there is a curious reference that reads, the Western scholar Li Ma Do, which is his Chinese name, or Ricci, orally dictated the text, while the Chinese scholar, Xu Wangqi, received the dictation with his brush. This is a beautiful poetic expression. Hence, we have an initial oral translation, Hu Yi, by Ricci, and a polishing of the text in Chinese, Bi Shou, by Xu. 
So it shows this close scholarly collaboration between the two. It's this spirit, in fact, of collaboration and the common pursuit of knowledge, both human <coughs> and divine, that characterizes Ricci's interactions with the many scholars he befriended. Hence, he truly was the sociable scholar. He himself comments on this in a rare letter that has been preserved that he wrote to his own father back in Macerata, in Italy, Giovanni Battista Ricci, on the 10th of May, 1605. Seen here, this is, you see here on a hill, the city of Macerata, in a, in a painting by the famed Chinese artist Li Jinyan. And this is what uh, he says. My task consists of continuously making and receiving visits to and from scholars who come in an uninterrupted stream to ask about our faith and our science. Every day I teach one, two, and sometimes three lessons for Jesuits who are learning Chinese characters or to those from outside who want to learn our science. I preach on the Christian feast days, and I always try to write something in Chinese. In one of his final works, entitled A History of the Entry of the Society of Jesus in Christianity into China, the Entrada de la Compañía de Jesús en Cristianidad de la China, he has much to say about this special relationship with Xu Wanti, who also became his first convert among the literati. Let's now hear how Ricci describes his good friend. Dr. Paul, whose sole concern seems to be to find a way for our fathers and the culture of our lands to be accepted with authority, in order to promote further Christianity, consulted Father Matteo on how to translate some of our books dealing with the natural sciences. He thus hoped to demonstrate to the literati of this kingdom the extent of our diligence in investigating all phenomena and the solid foundations on which we base our affirmations and proofs. And in this way, they would come to understand that also with regard to our holy religion, we had not been moved to follow it without reason. And as we spoke of various books, we decided that for now, it would be best to translate the elements of Euclid. But Ricci goes further in his thinking. He came to believe that Chinese civilization and the Chinese exceeded in their virtue other ancient civilizations, including his own. He is following the dictates of conscience that are part of a common humanity. This is how he puts it. In ancient times, they, that is the Chinese, followed the natural law more fully than in our countries. And 1,500 years ago, this people was not inclined to the worship of idols. And those they did adore were not like the evil idols worshipped by the Egyptians, Greeks, or Romans, but rather men whom they considered virtuous and who had performed many good deeds. On the contrary, the books of the literati, which are the most ancient and authoritative among their writings, do not adore anything but heaven and earth, and the Lord of both. And if we examine these books, we will find little therein against the light of reason, and much that is in conformity with it. And we can hope in divine mercy and that many of their ancient sages were saved by their observance of the natural law with the help that God would have given them on account of their goodness. This then is the approach that Ricci adopted with regard to the Chinese classics and the ancient culture of Confucian moral philosophy. In fact, he would go so far as to say that the translation that he offered for the word God, Tian Zhu, or Lord of Heaven, was an expression that was actually already present 
in the Confucian classics. And he said, a little bit like, oh, I'm going to tell you about the God that you worship that you're not even aware of that's already present in your own culture. Thus, for Ricci, cultural dialogue is founded first and foremost on the basis of a common humanity that necessarily leads to friendship. He spells out his thinking in some detail in his famous Jiao Yongun, which was a treatise on friendship, which he wrote in 1595. A selection of Greek and Latin maxims, that is, short sayings on friendship taken from the Western classics, it quickly became his most popular and enduring work in China and made him famous throughout the Chinese world of the literati as a man of culture. After decades in China as a missionary, he came to understand that the real issue that he needed to address was, what was this? Could there be a new primitive church as in the times of ancient Greece and of ancient Rome? So too in China. Could other world civilizations encounter and receive the Christian gospel without having to give up their own language, their own cultural identity, and who they were? Could one become Christian without having to become a foreigner in one's own land? To elucidate this drama, I'm going to show you this wonderful tree, which I really love. So, let's imagine historical Christianity with its millennia of religious, cultural, social, and political history as similar to a fully grown baobab tree, which is, however, a tree native to tropical Madagascar, mainland Africa, and Australia. Now, let us imagine trying to uproot, transport, and transplant it to Chestnut Hill in the middle of winter. Would this even be possible? How long would the tree survive, or would it simply die? So the question for Ricci and his successors became rather, if it was not about transplanting European culture, then how would Christianity actually take root in China and grow? And if so, under what circumstances? To formulate a creative understanding of how the seeds of Christianity could be sown in Chinese soil, Ricci looked for inspiration to the example of St. Paul, who firmly maintained that Gentile converts did not have to become Jews in order to become Christians. This was the great debate that took place at the Council of Jerusalem. What is the difference? Because, of course, initially, as you all know, Christianity was completely Jewish. But then came the problem, as you all know, well, can Romans and Greeks also become Christians. And this was where the, be the debate took place. And the missionaries <coughs> saw this debate replaying itself in China and also earlier in Japan. And so too, which he knew he had to take the risk of stepping outside of his comfort zone, putting aside even his own culture and language, if he wished to engage the Chinese people. It did not mean abandoning his own cultural tradition, but at least suspending judgment on the other culture. It was a daunting and a lonely task. Let me conclude with a paraphrased comment on an important defining characteristic of Ricci's life, offered by Professor Luigi Minini, Director, uh, he's the director of the Ricci Institute in Macerata, Ricci's hometown. And this is what he says, and I'm paraphrasing this in English translation. 
In short, it was all about a very particular capacity to stand before his own reads and the established image of his own identity. In other words, he possessed a special ability to become a stranger to himself, that is not to close in exclusively on his own desires or previously held opinions, so that he might acquire the ability to encounter others as they truly are in their diversity. To do this required inner discipline. He first needed to become master of his own inner world so that he could serenely reach out to others. And so literally, before he could utter anything meaningful, Ricci spent long years of his life in solitude, engaged in solitary study, learning the Chinese language and its classical literature and philosophy so that he could be a worthy interlocutor. We always look at people's lives from the end of their lives and all the things that they have achieved, just like we look at an Olympic athlete from the, the last success. But how much effort and pain and sweat went into that before you achieved those successes? Once the Chinese discovered him, so to speak, it was only then that he was inundated with social visits that would consume all of his time and energy. In fact, he also writes that he doesn't even sometimes have time to sleep because he has to receive all of these formal visits. And once you receive a formal visit, you then have to pay the visit back. You receive a gift, then you have to, you have to pay a, a, a visit and give another gift. You receive a poem, you must reciprocate with another poem. So it was in recognition of these heroic efforts his humility and his patience, <coughs> Pope Francis declared him venerable, someone worthy of our prayers, and a model still today for Christians everywhere. <coughs> we remain called, I think, to be open to other cultures and peoples in a world that still struggles so hard as we see, particularly in this time of war, to be tolerant and magnanimous towards those who are different from ourselves. This is something we can learn from Ricci, the sociable scholar and solitary saint. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. And um, we have uh, like six, seven minutes for some questions. Or if anyone would like to ask a question, I have the mic. <coughs> Anthony, two things occurred to me as you were speaking. One is that um, he, uh, through his natural science uh, knowledge, was able to uh, impress and, and have an inroad for Christianity. And one was typography, and the other one was uh, mathematics or geometry. Was astronomy also uh, one that uh, he used or that allowed him uh, to impress or gain an inroad? And then about Buddhism and uh, Confucianism. Where, uh, as both, I guess, were springboards from, to write about Christianity, uh, to use that as a basis, I guess, as you explained. What, um, how did that work out in terms of it? It seems as though they decided that Confucianism would be the way to go as a, uh, as a spring from to introduce Christianity to the culture. But anyway, if you could say any more about that, I would, that would be great. Certainly, Ricci did have knowledge of astronomy. In fact, on his 1602 map, but even uh, he produced a map earlier in the 1580s, a simpler map. Then the 1602 map, which was reproduced in 1604, has also quite a bit of astronomical data on it. He wouldn't be as brilliant in this area as his successors, Ferdinand Pavese and Johann Adam Schall von Bell, who would end up actually building the astronomical observatory uh, in Beijing. So this is about uh, a generation
generation and a half later after his death, but he did have, he did also um, have this knowledge. And um, it's quite interesting because, again, cartography has to do with this idea of where are we and how do we, how do we place ourselves in the world? And there were different, at the time, world views. As we know, you know, some people in the West for a time believed the world was flat, you could fall off the edge of it. You had uh, people who were, of course, uh, looking for the Northwest Passage to China, and that's, in a, in a way, how Columbus and others ended up reaching the shores of the Americas. There was a lot of debate on what that also meant for your one's own culture. I think this is something that they realized quite, uh, quite early on. And so I think that this is one uh, important thing. And remind me, the second issue was Confucianism. Confucianism. So again, this is quite complex, but there was a there was a again a different relationship between the ruling powers in China and in Japan, for example, with Buddhism. But Buddhism and Buddhist monks were not very well respected at that particular time. And moreover, there was a certain also interreligious conflict. Certainly, certainly the uh, missionaries experienced this also um, in Japan. You know, and it became in some ways a bit of a fruitless, um, you might say, argument over whether what you believe is right or whether what we believe is right. And so Ricci was able to remove that discussion to a more philosophical discussion. Yet, in, in a very, I would say, using the best of his own tradition and his own experience, that of the idea of the natural law. Let's begin with things that we can all agree on and explore that first, rather than try to go into immediate discussion of religious doctrine, which is not going to get us anywhere. And also, of course, the mandarins ruled China. That was the way to become someone in China. You had to pass the, uh, the examination that was, that was um, basically organized every couple of years, both at the provincial and national levels. And as he said, this is the only way to be a real noble in China, is to be a scholar. So this opened up a different world of dialogue. Well, this, this is quite interesting because, of course, there have been a lot of theories, theories about this, um, on how, first of all, how Valiano uh, viewed Europe at the time. Now, he was from a town called Chieti in uh, central Italy in the Abruzzi region, which at the time was under Spanish domination. So basically, most of Italy was, of course, dominated by different powers. And we are in the midst of, of course, the Reformation and the Counter-Reformation, or what would later become called the Catholic Reformation, but regardless of how we name it, it was a time of great conflict and strife within Europe. So Valignano was impressed by the fact that such a vast, as he says, China is a vast empire, it's a vast kingdom, and it's ruled in an orderly fashion by one emperor and all of his scholarly officials. And I think it was a very sort of renaissance, actually ideal almost, classical Roman and Greek idea that you know you would have, I mean, think of Renaissance uh, Tuscany, you have the, the, the city of Pienza, which is supposed to be the perfect city. But all that perfection, this is the time also, you know, Machiavelli writing, well, we're not in a perfect world. In fact, we're in a world of strife and murder and war. And Valignano has this very European, very Renaissance idea, and he says, well, I see some of that possibility in a place that is so vast with one, you know, Europe is governed by kings and princes. Of course, Italy is under a number of different dukes, princes, and not only kings, or foreign kings. China is governed by its own people, 
by one emperor and by its scholarly class. And I think this appealed to him as a, as a man of the Italian Renaissance. Yes. Thank you for Wondering, like, uh, did church endorse everything that uh, Luigi did, or was there any disagreement about the approach that he used to introduce Christianity in China? Because um, you know, he, his approach is to associate Christianity with science and physics and math, 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 math right? And uh, is this something that the people have disagreement about? Well. Entire libraries have been written to answer your question. Because, of course, in, in about 34 years after Ricci's death, you, come, you have the beginning of the Chinese rights controversy. And the whole question of can you perform these rights to your ancestors. But the more important point, besides all the, the forest of details on the Chinese rights controversy, the bigger issue is what does that actually mean from a religious point? And of course, there were those who disagreed also with the certain words in, in the translation. Translation of terms, of Christian terminology, was a huge debate. And in fact, even though there was a lot of debate about not adapting to Buddhism, but many Buddhist words ended up being adopted, also in Japan, from classical texts. Uh, words, uh, for example, like the word for compassion, or salvation, etc. These are all words that already had precedence in Buddhist vocabulary. But I think in, in China it was more a more radical adaptation, whereas in Japan what happened was they started to also use transliterated forms of certain Western words not to create confusion. Now, uh, was it accepted by all? No, not even among his own fellow Jesuits. There were some of his Jesuits who said this is not the right way to proceed. And others, others said, uh, no, this is the only way we can proceed. So it, it became a tension and a debate, and that debate lasted until basically the 20th century, when, when the Pope finally declared the Chinese rights are civil rights, they're not a form of idolatry, and they are acceptable. But that took 350 years to sort out. So one thing when you talk about anything in the history of the Catholic Church, nothing happens unless you wait 200 years, at least. <laughs> so uh, that's the minimum. So we may have a, a complete answer to your question, maybe in 200 years from now. <laughs> in fact, one of the things that I always think, and this is why I really like this question of the primitive church, I think it's the, it's the key issue. Because if, that, if it is possible for this pagan culture of Rome and Greece to become Christian, which nobody could have imagined before Constantine. Nobody could have imagined that, that the Greeks who made fun of Paul as being some you know, bump, country bumpkin who was talking about re resurrection and I don't know what. And it was in that language that the Gospels were written. And, in the, and the first councils of the church, many of them were in Greek. So why can't we have, you know, the first, second, third Beijing Council one day when the language of the council will be actually Chinese and it'll be translated into other languages? Or we have we have a council, uh, the Council of uh, of Kerala, and we have we have it we have the main documents written in Malayalam and translated into other languages. So I think that's the interesting question that all of this poses, is can other cultures be fully integrated and then also make their contribution to Christianity? Ruben. Uh, so, uh, it's almost one. OK. Is that a short question? Yeah. OK. okay. Good. <laughs> <laughs> so I hope we can, we can turn to <laughs> His search for this foundational similarity between Hinduism and Pantheism. Is that 
trouble at the end of his career falling on the Lord's wings. So he said he was very gracious for the Hebrews. No, he was not moving towards baptism. Absolutely not. And he didn't actually get in trouble that much with the Dominicans because that really becomes an issue of how they interpret him several decades after his death. How do you know that, though? Well, we, you, the only way we can know these things is through documentation that exists. And what's that? Do you have other documents that would suggest that? Well, we, we see some of the first documents coming out already in the 60s, 20s, 30s, and 40s, which is going to lead up to the Chinese rights controversy. But by that time, Yuchi is dead. He's no longer alive. So, so that, I think, is an important thing. Yeah. OK, so we Hopefully, you know, we are going to finish this lecture. Thank you very much for attending. Uh,